So first of all, celiac disease also goes by some other names that you may have seen. Um, it's called celiac sprue or gluten sensitive enteropathy. Uh, it is not the same thing as gluten sensitivity or gluten insensitivity. We're going to talk about that, but that's something a little bit different. Uh, celiac disease is the most uh, common term you'll see though. Now gluten, since we mentioned gluten sensitive enteropathy, is a storage protein that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And technically speaking, gluten really isn't found in barley or rye. Uh, other storage proteins are found in theirs, but we use the term gluten kind of to collectively refer to the storage proteins in these three products. When an individual with celiac disease ingests gluten, they'll actually activate their own immune system, and that immune system will then in turn go around and actually attack the small bowel or small intestinal lining, and that will end up flattening the villi or the little finger-like growths of the small intestine that help us absorb materials and then this will obviously then lead to poor absorption of nutrients. The consequences of this will be seen as we go through the talk. Now this is a pretty complicated cartoon. Don't, don't get too panicked when you see it. My wife wanted me to delete this slide, but I think pictures are good. Um, up at the very top, this is the gluten that the individual ingests, the little green balls. They get across the lining of the intestine of the small bowel and they get made more presentable by something called tissue transglutaminase. Once they're more presentable or more attractive, certain cells called APCs will then take them and stick them on something called DQ2 or DQ8, and this is important when we get to later on. This will then present it to your T cell, which is a white cell, will activate that T cell. That T cell will then go ahead and produce all kinds of chemicals and mediators that will lead to destruction and inflammation of your bowel. And that's really the pathology of celiac disease in a nutshell. I mentioned it flattens out the villi. Well, in picture A, you can see what the normal villi appears to be like. It sort of looks like a shag rug. Uh, in picture B, the individual who has celiac disease, those villi have been flattened out uh, completely. And in picture C is a microscopic image of those villi, they're like little finger-like projections. And in picture D, the individual with celiac disease, you can see it appears that somebody went ahead and just shaved off all those villi. So you've lost a massive amount of absorptive or surface area off of those finger-like growths. And now you have a much less area to absorb and therefore you're going to lead to the long-term complications and short-term symptoms of celiac disease. And celiac disease isn't just a disease of the gastrointestinal tract. Most of you are probably aware that there are numerous organ systems that are involved if you have celiac or can be involved. In children you really have to worry about growth delays or developmental delays. Uh, there's a concern about malignancies, anemia, Obviously, there's the gastrointestinal symptoms people are probably familiar with. You can end up with bone problems, such as osteoporosis and fractures, problems with your central nervous system, and problems with the skin as well as reproduction. We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. For every case that we know about, there's probably three to seven more cases that are undiagnosed out there. Okay, so what celiac disease is not, it is not a food allergy. I have a lot of people come in and tell me that they're allergic to wheat, or that, that's something different. Food allergies are not common in adults, true food allergies are maybe more common in children. This is not a food allergy. It is not the same as gluten intolerance. Gluten intolerance is very similar to lactose intolerance. You eat gluten, you feel ill right away, but you're not doing any damage to your body, and you shouldn't have any effects outside of the GI tract. It is not age dependent. You can be diagnosed with celiac disease really at any age. It can become active at, at any time. It can kind of lay dormant for a long time. So I've seen people diagnosed with it in their 70s and obviously children and infants can be diagnosed. And it's kind of common sense, but it's not contagious or transmissible, but I uh, to just make sure that you're not going to catch it from a friend or family member. So how do we screen for it? How do we diagnose it? The blood test is really the gold standard right now. I shouldn't say gold standard, it's really the best way to launch into the diagnosis. The antibody that I prefer is what's called an anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody. A little technical, but some of you may be familiar with that test or seen labs in the past on yourselves. It's called the anti-TTG is another name for it. It's 
very sensitive, 95% of the time it'll give you the right answer. So if you have celiac disease and that test is negative, it's going to be right 95% of the time. That still leaves a 5% question though. There's another antibody called an endomesial antibody. It's a little bit more prone to uh, technical um, variances with the test, but it's also very good. You have to be very cautious though when using these antibodies because I mentioned the IgA deficiency that can be seen with celiac. 5% of people with celiac will be IgA deficient. And what are those antibodies? They're both IgA antibodies. So if you don't make any IgA antibodies or you make minimal IgA antibodies, you're going to test false negative. And that's where that extra 5% loss comes from. That's why the test is only about 95% sensitive. Um, Anti-gliadin antibodies is what we used to use. We really don't recommend those anymore for adults. I have a lot of patients who've come into clinic with a positive anti-gliadin antibody and they were told they have celiac disease. It's, it's very poorly sensitive and specific. It's wrong about a third of the time. So don't ever make a diagnosis or let someone tell you you have celiac disease based on an isolated positive anti-gliadin antibody. Now small bowel biopsies are really the way to go. This is the true gold standard. If you have a positive antibody, a positive tissue transglutaminase or endomesial antibody, you should go ahead and talk to your gastroenterologist, primary care provider, about getting a small bowel biopsy. This is done quite simply these days. It takes just a few minutes. We do it with endoscopy where we give you a little bit of light sedation. We go down, we take a couple biopsies, we have an answer for you in a few days. Um, if you have the skin rash, the dermatitis herpetiformis, and that's been biopsied and is consistent with it, you can actually skip the endoscopic biopsy. But the bottom line and the critical point here I can't stress enough is that you should never make the diagnosis of celiac disease without one of these biopsies. And the point or the reason is that going on a gluten-free diet, a true gluten-free diet, is a major cost constraint, can lead to social isolation, and, and it's, a, it's a big deal, um, and it's for the rest of your life. So you really want to know if you have this, and I, I think that you want, you want the gold standard to make the diagnosis before embarking on that. So this is what it looks like endoscopically when you go down with the camera. Uh, I'm going to kind of point out some aspects of this here. We're going through the small bowel right now, and although you don't have normal to compare it to, you kind of get the sense that the folds have these little divots or ridges in them. Okay, you don't see any of those fluffy villi. With the magnification we use with our current scopes, you should see those little finger-like villi. You see these notches on the folds here, little notches here, and this kind of mosaic or tile pattern, very classic for what we'd see, and they're showing you some of those notching. Normally you should not see those little bites off the folds there. And that's a pretty classic finding of what celiac disease would look like. Now, of course, we're going to still go ahead and biopsy that because we want to be sure. There are other things that can cause such a look. But when I see that in the setting of an antibody positivity, I'm very suspicious that we have celiac disease. Okay, so why do you have to be on a gluten-free diet? If 80% of people with celiac disease have no symptoms, why do you want to torture yourself with a gluten-free diet? Well, there's numerous vitamin and mineral deficiencies you might not know you even have and have no symptoms from, you can have long-term complications from. You could be deficient in iron and calcium. Um, calcium can, deficiencies in that can lead to the osteoporosis and fractures. The B vitamins can lead to the neurologic complications. You can have difficulties or problems with your fat-soluble vitamins. Specifically, vitamin K can lead to bleeding disorders and hemorrhage. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to uh, get these corrected. As I mentioned with the calcium, you can also have low bone mass, osteoporosis, and bone fractures. So um, you want to go on a gluten-free diet, that will reverse. Uh, and we also talked about the fertility and pregnancy issues. You want to make sure you give your, you know, your, your pregnancy the best shot. So if you have celiac disease, even though you feel great, you want to be on your gluten-free diet for that just as much as you'd want to take your prenatal vitamin and, and, and go to your prenatal appointments. And surprisingly, out of those 80% who have no symptoms, I see a large number of people who come in and tell me they just feel great once we've diagnosed their celiac disease and put them on a gluten-free diet. How much of that is psychological? How much of that is real? I think there's, there's a little bit to be said for both. But there is definitely this, this syndrome of this improved sense of well-being and even those people who felt they never had any symptoms to begin with. So those are good reasons. Another good reason to be on a gluten-free diet is this risk of cancer in the setting of celiac disease. 
Small bowel lymphomas are the most common cancer in celiac disease, and these are very deadly cancers. The survival is quite poor. You can see that at 13% of people will only be uh, left alive after 30 months of diagnosis, and the cancer is widespread at diagnosis. The good news is that if you put someone on a gluten-free diet after one year, their risk of this lymphoma goes back down to the average population. So you don't have to live in fear of this once you've gotten yourself on a gluten-free diet, but it's a strong reason to be on one. There's other cancers that also appear to go down in risk when you're on a gluten-free diet, esophageal cancers and other small bowel cancers. Um, and as I mentioned, there's real good evidence that the gluten-free diet will protect against the development of these. Okay, so there's six steps in management I like to outline with my patients. First step is meeting with a knowledgeable and, I should say, interested dietitian. You want to educate yourself. I like to educate my patients on the disease like we're doing tonight. And you really want to look at this as a lifelong disease and lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet. You want to make sure there's no nutritional deficiencies. I'll seek those out with my patients and we'll treat the ones that are present. I like to give people information on advocacy groups and I have some information at the end of the talk on this. And finally, I don't just make a diagnosis of celiac disease and send you on your way. I like to see you back frequently, at least once a year, if not twice a year, and continue to manage you and make sure there's no long-term problems. Okay, so the, the principal treatment here, this is the part people probably are most interested in, is uh, the dietary management. And you really need to avoid all sources of gluten. Okay, so mainly that includes wheat, barley, and rye. And if you see something that says wheat-free, please be careful because that does not equal gluten-free because it could still have barley or rye or could have been processed in a facility where wheat was processed. Um, oats should be avoided initially um, because they're close in the family group to the wheat products, but also because they're often processed in the same plants where wheat is processed. If you really want oats in your diet, uh, I don't have a problem with that, but I only will say in the people who've had mild and are controlled disease, and we limit to only two ounces per day, and we introduce it carefully, and we watch you. I watch your antibodies. I watch your symptoms if you have any. Um, really closely if you're going to go on oats. So oats aren't completely contraindicated, but you just have to be cautious with them. So please be careful the hidden gluten. I like to go through this with folks too. Um, it, it's pretty much in numerous condiments, um, and I'll show you a few examples up there. But interesting things are cosmetics, mainly lip items. You, have to, you don't have to worry about your, your eyeliner. Uh, it's your lip items because you may be ingesting that. So if you use a lipstick or uh, a moisture, uh, you need to make sure that it actually is gluten-free, uh, believe it or not. Medications, it's, uh, it's a real big thing with medications to inquire and to check. And I'll show you some resources on how to figure out if your medications are gluten-free. Unfortunately, the U.S. labeling regulations are very poor. They're very lax. They're working on this. This is getting better. It's better than it used to be, but it still has a long way to go, so you really have to be cautious. Um, basically, if in doubt, go without is my motto. Um, and be proactive. Call the company. Go to their website. Seek it out. The information is getting more and more out there. You have to be careful about preparing your food in the same area. At home, if you have a celiac individual, you really have to have your own toaster. Um, if you're going to use the same grill or pan, it really has to be scrubbed clean. A deep fryer. If you go out to eat at a restaurant that says they're gluten-free, you have to be careful if they fry something that they use the same oil to just to you know, fry French toast or something in there. You, there's going to be gluten sitting in that oil. So you really have to ask these questions. Uh, also, multiple use spreads. You have some margarine at home or some mayonnaise and you're husband or wife who's not celiac takes their knife, spreads it on their bread, and sticks it back in the margarine, that margarine is now contaminated. You need to have your own separate one. So some things that most people don't necessarily think about right off the bat when they're first diagnosed. So you got to watch out. Here's some fun places where you can find. You can find it in sauces, gravies, thickeners, marinades. Soy sauce is a common place. Processed lunch meat, you wouldn't think about it, but they have it in there. Croutons, bacon bits, if anybody still eats those. <laughs> Communion wafers. 
and Play-Doh. Not that you're eating Play-Doh, but if your children have celiac disease and they're playing with Play-Doh and then they don't wash their hands and go and eat lunch, they can actually get gluten from that. So um, there are certain kids' clays that are gluten-free. Okay, more on dietary management. You may want to avoid dairy products initially because the lactase enzyme is at the tip of those villi. And those villi which are shaved off, you're going to be someone who is lactose intolerant until those villi grow back. So eventually you should be able to get back on dairy, but dairy per se is, is not a gluten-containing product. As I showed you earlier, rice, corn, um, sorghum, uh, they're all safe. Potatoes, buckwheat, tapioca, quinoa, these are all safe gluten-free items, naturally gluten-free items. All fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables are safe. Uh, meats, not including the processed lunch meats, and fish are safe. A distilled alcohol and wine are safe. And the reason is the gluten is a large molecule. So when you distill an alcohol, that gluten will not be processed over. Uh, however, unfortunately for Oktoberfest fans, uh, beer, ales, lagers, are not safe. There are some gluten-free choices out there though. I've heard some of them are okay. Prognosis for uh, celiac disease is actually excellent with early diagnosis and the strict adherence to the gluten-free diet. If you do that, if you're on a gluten-free diet, your survival is going to be just as good as an age-matched population. And in children, if you catch it before puberty, they should have a normal growth and developmental. They may need to catch up a little bit, but they should catch up. Uh, interestingly, people who have celiac disease and aren't diagnosed to later are on average about three inches shorter than their non-celiac population. And it, adults, as I mentioned earlier, many of the manifestations will resolve once you go on a gluten-free diet. The infertility issues, the vitamin deficiencies, the diarrhea, the skin lesions. Unfortunately, some of those neurologic symptoms I mentioned may be a little bit more permanent um, and if you have compression fractures in your spine, obviously those aren't going to go away if, if, if you go on a gluten-free diet, but at least you maybe will not get any more.